What do you expect fairies to do? They're meant to be nice, kind things. This is young Jennifer Connolly auditioning to play the lead role of Sarah in the George Lucas produced and Jim Henson directed fantasy movie Labyrinth. Despite the fact that Helena Bonham Carter also auditioned to play the part and the producers were keen to cast either Ali Sheedy or Jane Krabowski for the role, it was this audition that made Connolly win the production over and she was cast. Where we get Labyrinth. Although originally considered a box office failure, it would go on to be considered a childhood classic in this 1986 coming of age movie, where a young girl called Sarah must go on an adventure in a strange fairy tale world of the labyrinth to save her infant brother from the clutches of the sinister Goblin King. Played brilliantly by David Bowie, who has delightful menace and very tight tights. Although we may think that we know this movie like the back of our hands, I mean, come on, many of us grew up with this film. What about the old scripts which demonstrate a labyrinth that could have been completely different? A version that we never got. So let's sit back, relax, and take a look at the lost version of Labyrinth. Labyrinth the way that you've never seen it. That's a we'll right away. So here I have my Labyrinth lunchbox, my Labyrinth jigsaw puzzle, 500 pieces, a Jareff action figure, and of course, nah, I'm just a worm. So let's check out the version of Labyrinth that you've never seen. Before we get nightmares over how horrific the Hoggle Puppet looks now, thanks to years of deterioration. Ugh, let's check it out. So before we explore some original scrapped ideas with Labyrinth, let's take a quick look into the movie's backstory. Labyrinth was conceived by Jim Henson, along with English fantasy illustrator Brian Frude and Canadian poet Dennis Lee. Henson wanted to work on his second movie after The Dark Crystal, but this time he wanted the story to be a fairy tale, a callback to stories like The Wizard of Oz and Alice in Wonderland. Stories that see a young female protagonist who is taken away from her mundane life and placed in a fantastical adventure. Although, apparently the production was nearly shut down as soon as it started, as it was discovered that the story bared striking similarities to the children's books Outside Over There and Where the Wild Things Are, both of which were by author Maurice Sendak. Especially outside over there, which like Labyrinth, sees a young girl having to save an infant sibling after being kidnapped by goblins. Sendak's lawyers told Henson that he should probably shut down the production of Labyrinth. Yeah, that could have been the end of it. But thankfully the dispute was settled outside of court. So the basic, bare structure of the story was put together, and Brian Frude had worked on some concept drawings. And honestly, some of them are truly amazing. I mean, wow, look at that. Former Monty Python Terry Jones was approached to write the script for Labyrinth as Henson's daughter read the novel Eric the Viking, which was a children's novel that Jones had written and she loved it. So Jones worked with a novella of Labyrinth that was written by Dennis Lee, along with Brian Frude's illustrations, where he would then write the script. However, throughout the shoot of Labyrinth, the script would constantly be rewritten, where supposedly the script would go through a whopping 25 rewrites, with many writers coming and going to work on the script, including the movie's producer George Lucas and Elaine May, who previously worked on the script for Tootsie. Jones felt that the final film of Labyrinth was greatly different to his original script, and that basically he had one vision of the movie, and Jim Henson had his own vision of the movie, and clearly both these visions clashed. Even though Jones was solely credited for writing the script, he didn't think that what was seen on the screen was his work. The biggest difference between Jones' original vision and the final film is the Goblin King. In the original script, you don't see the Goblin King or the center of the labyrinth until the movie's climax, with the mystery and Jareth's reveal to be a sort of hook that keeps people's interest. However, Jones felt that the casting of David Bowie changed Labyrinth, as Henson wanted to have extensive scenes of Bowie along with songs for the Goblin King to sing throughout the movie. 
Hey, I guess they paid for Bowie, so they were going to damn well make sure that they used him. In one of the original scripts, the Goblin King is a downright nasty piece of work, where the night where Sarah is babysitting Toby, Jareth gains entry into Sarah's house by disguising himself as the author of the play that Sarah is reading and performing at the start of the movie, where he goes by the name Robin Zakar where he uses this disguise to trick Sarah into letting him in the house, which I guess there's a don't answer your door to strangers message there. Once in the house, he walks up to Toby and starts doing magic tricks for him. Now at this stage, Sarah is really freaked out by this and asks him to leave, but he doesn't, making him even more sinister. And once Jareth reveals himself, he snatches Toby by force. This is when Sarah arrives in the world of the labyrinth. Oh, and this early version of the script also features a bar in the labyrinth in which the wise one and the hat shows up at said bar. <laughs> yeah, imagine the weird creatures from the labyrinth at a bar getting absolutely drunk. <laughs> now, it was originally intended for Jareth himself to be a puppet, just like all the other bizarre creatures of labyrinth until Henson decided that the Goblin King should have a larger-than-life charismatic presence, and he felt that a pop star would have this charisma, and would also be able to deliver the musical numbers, where Sting, Mick Jagger, and Michael Jackson were sought after to play the part, until David Bowie accepted the role. But as soon as he was cast, he nearly dropped out, as he did not like this earlier script, and felt that more humour should be added or he would consider leaving the production. So the pressure was on to add more humour. Now in the original script, Toby wasn't called Toby, but his name was actually Freddy. And the character became Toby when the part went to the infant son of the movie's art director, Brian Frude, who of course is called Toby Frude. And if you want to feel old, this is what he looks like now. <laughs> yep, Toby Frude himself is now a special effects puppeteer. Also in this script, at the start of Sarah's journey, when Jareth gives Sarah just 13 hours, he also hands her a watch, so she is able to keep track of time. Yep, a strange supernatural labyrinth watch. Then there's the scene where Sarah encounters the Fireys, horrific creatures who can take off their limbs and swap them around, which when I was a kid was just absolutely disturbing. Well, in this sequence, these creatures sing a song called Chili Down. However, available on YouTube is an early version of the song, which features Bowie himself singing the song. So I don't know if the Jareth character was originally meant to sing Chili Down, but it's still fascinating. The website, Across the Pond TV, WordPress, also explores several other deleted scenes from another unused script. Like, behind the door with the knocker who has the ring through his ear is a swimming pool, and Hoggle goes through the door and nearly drowns as he can't swim. Also throughout the movie, as time goes on, Toby is actually starting to physically transform into a goblin. And the creepy old lady puppet in the junkyard was actually Jareth in disguise, trying to manipulate Sarah. And in this scene, Sarah has a vision that if she accepts the garbage lady's offer to just stay in her room with all her toys, she will become the garbage lady, where Sarah starts to see herself becoming old, creating a really surreal, nightmarish scene. In the movie's climax, where Sarah confronts Jareth, he sort of gives Sarah an ultimatum by saying he'd rather have a queen than a little goblin prince. And Sarah is so disgusted with Jareth, she literally calls him a miserable creep and punches him in the face and kicks him in the shin. Yeah, she goes full Rambo on him. Jareth can't believe that she's resisted his charms, which makes him revert into a sniveling little goblin. Yeah, in this version of the movie, Jareth isn't an owl, but a goblin himself. As Jareth starts to shrink into a smaller, crippled-up form, he says, quote, Why does everything happen to me? Which, as Across the Pond puts it, is a phrase that Sarah herself often uses. Um, so could it be that Sarah and Jareth are actually one and the same? Well, if we go by the movie's dream logic, then... Yeah, he is totally her creation. There's actually an alternative ending available on YouTube that was put up by a channel called Laszlo, where the confrontation between Jareth and Sarah is a little different. Firstly, you can tell that this version was actually filmed quite differently to the final film. And when Sarah tells him that he has no power over her, he actually responds to her with warmth, shortly before reverting back into his owl formation. 
One person wrote in the comments section that this comes across that Jareth was actually trying to help Sarah and encourage her to stand up for herself. And yeah, I get that. As odd as it is, it does seem like he's actually on her side. Even the goblins were looking on and seemingly on Sarah's side and championing her to defeat Jareth's charms. There are some snippets available featuring footage that was filmed and intended to be in the movie but was cut. For example, at the start of the movie, shortly before Jareth reveals himself, all the goblins approach Sarah, where she picks up a broom and tries to fend them away with the broom. Later on, we would see some goblin guards using their armor to make a sort of dragon puppet. The illustrated book features some dialogue which was cut from the ball scene. In the final film, we just hear the David Bowie song, As the World Falls Down. But originally, Jareth was talking to Sarah, trying to lure her away from Toby, where he tells her, quote, All you can think about is me. Okay, um, this is starting to feel like a situation where we're gonna find Chris Hansen in the kitchen. So Jareth is trying to make Sarah forget about her brother and her quest. In the original script, it's suggested that when Sarah goes into the ballroom dream, she actually sees what she really wants. And that seems to be Jareth. And this kind of gives us a clue into what Jareth is. George Lucas himself said that Jareth is like the devil. He draws people in and is completely alluring and has the ability to make people infatuated with him. And that's why they cast a pop star. That's what a pop star slash rock star is. Brian Frude, who designed Jareth, basically said that Jareth is a pop star. He's meant to look like a pop star, the kind that a young teenage girl would idolize and put posters up on their wall of, or as he puts it, a young girl's dream. So much so, the cane that he uses throughout the film, if you look closely, is a microphone. In fact, as far as the infamous Bowie bulge goes, well, that was actually intentional. So essentially, Jareth is a rock slash pop star, the embodiment of star idolization, or in this case, teen idolization. However, the plot thickens. In the scene in Sarah's room, we briefly see that she has a scrapbook, which contains context which never actually gets mentioned in the movie. It's a scrapbook of Sarah's mum. We can learn through this scrapbook that her mum not being around has hit her quite hard, and that she's struggling with her mother's absence. In these clippings, we can see that Sarah's mum was a stage and theatre actress, thanks to her featuring on the cover of Playbill. And this explains Sarah's love and fascination of starring in plays, when we see her rehearsing in the park at the start of the movie. We also see that Sarah's mum has seemingly had a highly publicised affair with another on-stage actor. And this man who Sarah's mum has been having an affair with was also played by David Bowie. And Labyrinth Wiki explains that Sarah's mom is called Linda, and the man that she's been having an affair with is called Jeremy. We can see by the newspaper articles in the book about the two having an on-again, off-again affair. And presumably the relationship was on and off because Sarah's mom already had a family. But ultimately, she couldn't resist the charms of Jeremy. And from these clippings, I guess we can learn that Sarah's mother has left Sarah and broken down their family to continue a relationship with Jeremy. In fact, Labyrinth Wiki confirms that Linda did leave the family to be with Jeremy. As the page puts it, so so she can live openly with him. Where they live an extravagant lifestyle of the rich and famous, like special events, extravagant dinners, basically a life full of luxury and vast expenses. And presumably that's why she's hardly in Sarah's life. Ouch. Now I've heard some suggestions over the years that maybe Sarah's mother passed away, but notice there is no articles about Sarah's mum passing away or dying. Also at the top of the second page is a torn up headline. It's hard to tell what it originally said, but notice how we see the last few words remaining, which reads, love, it's all over. Could that symbolize the love that Sarah's mother had for Sarah and her family and that it is all over? You see, I have this theory, and it's just a theory, that Sarah's labyrinth dream slash roleplay was her way of dealing with the absence of her mother and her mother's relationship with Jeremy. One fan of the movie told me that it could actually be Sarah's way of coping with it because something inappropriate slash sinister happened between Sarah and Jeremy, which is manifested in the form of the Goblin King. And yeah, that's very, very, very dark. But I can see that connection. But personally, I think the kidnapping of Little 
Toby shows Sarah's reluctance to embrace her new family unit, which we see at the start of the movie is turbulent, and that Toby is a manifestation of this new life that Sarah is now in. Hence, she seems to resent him at the start. Jareth represents her once and needs to keep her old family, her old lifestyle, to forget about Toby and just stay in her room with her toys, a life she had before the breakup. But through her adventure, and subsequently telling the Goblin King and possibly Jeremy that he has no power over her, she's able to get over her grief and embrace her new family dynamic. Almost like she's telling her grief that it has no power over her. The script symbolizes that Sarah is over her separation anxiety as it's learned that Sarah wears a ring that her mum gave her and that it's very important to her. However, by the end of the movie, Sarah is now over her grief as she actually gives the ring to Hoggle. The final movie has a similar scene, where when she returns from the labyrinth, she puts away a photo of her mum and Jeremy that she had on her mirror, suggesting that she has moved on and can now look to the future. And maybe this is the true heart of Labyrinth. Sarah was able to grow as a person and be able to love and accept Toby, and thus let go of the hardships of the past, and embrace what lies ahead of her. Well, this episode started off as a lost version of Labyrinth, but ended up with me going down a deep rabbit hole. But really though, there are many different ways that Labyrinth can be interpreted. And that's one of the things that makes it a brilliant movie, and one that was grossly underappreciated when it was originally released. Anyway, I'm Minty, and Disney, please, keep your hands off Labyrinth. At least let us have one. Just one Lucasfilm property that you haven't botched up. <laughs> See ya!